ask our fullest pray, and then we will um, go ahead and get started. Father, we come before you right now, thankful for this opportunity to open up your word. And Lord, we know that even though sometimes we experience difficulties and, and that, Lord, everything is worth waiting for. Lord, what a reminder. Just even now, Lord, we are personally um, getting worried and just need to take a breath and remember that we should patiently persevere as we continue to seek you. So bless our time together as we open up the word, Lord. We pray that you get all glory, all honor, praise. Lord, not allow, do not allow me to hinder anything that you have in store for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the things that um, I think about from my past is, and some of you know that my very first job I worked at an ice cream store, the ice cream parlor in Baldwin, Michigan, and um, it was a great time. And let me just pause for a moment to say thank you to Kim and Terry Jamison uh, at Jonesy's Homemade Ice Cream Parlor for giving me an opportunity to start working. You started my work career um, back in Baldwin, Michigan, and, and I pray that you guys are doing well and that Jonesy's is doing well. You know, one of the things about ice cream is this, it takes time. You have to wait for it. You know, it starts off as cream, and as it goes from heavy cream, they would put it into the machines, and they would add flavor, and then they would put it into a freezer, a 20 below zero freezer that would allow it to get rock hard. And then, after it was in there for some days, then they would take it and they would place it into a tempering freezer that was like around 20 degrees. And then from there, they would take it into the back room right before it was time to go into the serving spot. They would place it in the, uh, in the back room for about 20 minutes and it would get servable. And then they would place it into the serving freezer. So you had to wait a long time. You couldn't just say, I want ice cream right now. It was a process that had to go through it. And needless to say, the process was worth waiting for. Today, I wonder how good are we at waiting, at waiting, at waiting. How good are we, or are we impatient? Are you able to remain calm and joyful in the waiting? Do you find yourself operating from a sense of immediacy? What are you currently waiting for? And if you're honest, what are you tired of waiting for? What do you do when you're waiting for the Lord and it seems like he's asking you to wait a little bit longer? How do you handle the long silences from God? Today, we return to this power series from the book of James in chapter 5, where we find this is the last book of the Bible, and as the last book, there's only two sections left, this one and the one that we'll cover next week. Today, James is going to identify six different things that we could do in the waiting, six things that, that we could do to, to handle waiting. These things are patience, remembering Christ's return, not judging, suffering, remaining steadfast, and communication. So we look at this, and, and be honest for a moment. Anybody struggling with waiting? Some of us are waiting for this pandemic to end right now. We're tired of being at home. We're tired of, of doing things in a modified way. We just want to have normal back. And we're tired of waiting. And some of us are waiting because it's like everyone else is getting their stimulus check and they've been blowing it on just random stuff. But, but you need the stimulus check. You need it to, to eat this week. And you're like, I'm waiting. Some of our waiting is very difficult. And what do you do in the waiting process? Today, we look at this waiting. And instead of reading all of it all at once, I'm just going to read verse by verse that, that handles the different things that, that waiting is covered. So this first part is about patience. He is talking about waiting in the patience. So here's what it says. It says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. So he starts off this section with, with painting and, and waiting. He says, be patient in our waiting we must be willing to allow patience to be one of the fundamental principles. It must be one of the fundamental principles, being patient. Now, waiting is one thing, but patiently waiting is a whole nother thing, right? 
we must, like the farmer, trust that it will grow, right? Trust that it will grow. Trust that there is something that's happening underground that you don't get a chance to see, but you must trust that it's working out. Just like the farmer, he can't see what's happening underground, but he must trust the process. You know, one of my favorite movies was this movie called Faith Like Potatoes, because there was this guy who had the trust that something was growing. Even though it was the middle of a drought, he planted potatoes and said he was going to trust God. We got to trust God in the waiting. And when we're having this patience and understanding that God is cultivating something underground inside of our lives, we must say, you know what, God, it's worth waiting for. There are two areas of planting that we must begin to work on. The things that we plant internally and the things that we plant externally. Internally, we got to plant things that can take root. Take the word of God, take the fruit of the spirit, and we allow that, we, we read it, and we, and we say, Lord, I want this to grow on the inside of me. And so we begin to take more time with it, take more time with it, so that we can have more fruit and more of the fruit. We got to take the kindness and the peace and the joy, and we plant that deep inside of our hearts so that we can have this good thing that's growing. Now, externally, we also plant. We got to get some of the weeds out of you. We got to get some of the broken stumps out. Get some of the unhealthy, dormant things out of us, right? And when we do that and we get rid of the unhealthy habits and we let them die, you see, in order for a seed to grow, it has to be dead before you plant it into the ground. And, and what we understand is that we get this opportunity to get this dead stuff out of us. And we begin to plant that in the ground. We, we lay it down and we say, Lord, I'm taking my dead stuff. I'm taking my bad habits. I'm taking all this stuff that's no longer good. And I'm planting it in the ground because one of the things that we recognize about God is, is God specializes in taking something that wasn't and making it something that is. What did he do with dirt? Did he not take dirt and make man out of it? Did he not take a rib and make a woman out of it? You see, the things that we hold on to, and if we're willing to lay it down at God's feet and we say, you know what, I'm burying this in you. I'm not burying it inside of myself. I'm not, not dealing with something. I'm taking these things and I'm placing them and I'm burying them so that you can grow something on the inside of me, Lord. I am taking all of my unfruitfulness. I'm taking all of my shame, my past, my anger, my identity, my sexuality, my abuse, my pride, my selfishness, my rudeness, my doubt, my addictions, my rebellion. And I'm laying it down, Lord, so that you can grow something beautiful in my life. You know, let me say this. God is cultivating three things over in you over your lifetime. Three things in you over your lifetime. The things that he's doing in your life. He's cultivating the things that he's bringing you to. And he's cultivating the things that he's bringing you from. And as he cultivates those things, you must remember that in your lifetime, there is a lifetime or a life frame that involves eternity. And you must be patiently willing as we go through this waiting process to wait for what God is doing. So we have to have patience. So remain patient in the planting the cultivating, the watering, the growing, and the harvesting seasons in your waiting experience. Consider Jesus' example as seen in Hebrews 12, 2. Listen to this. He says, Look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, patiently endured the cross. Who? Jesus patiently endured the cross for you and for me. And as we remember his patience on the cross, because you know, you and I, we would, if we had the power, we would have got up off that cross. But Jesus patiently endured the cross. May we patiently endure our waiting. Which takes us to this next part of the text, which is establishing hearts on the Lord's return. Let's take a look. Verse 8, you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Establish your hearts, the coming of the Lord is at hand. When, when waiting, we must make sure that our eyes are gazed on the Lord's return. Keep that in perspective. Keep it in perspective. If we lose perspective that, that Jesus is returning, if we lose patience and, and forget that he is coming, we miss it all. 
consider the waiting of the early disciples. Think about these guys for a moment, right? I mean, imagine Thomas. Imagine Bartholomew. We don't talk much about these guys, but imagine them. You remember when, when Jesus ascended to the, the, to the heavens and they're up there looking? Angel came down and said, what are you looking for? He who's gone, he's going to come back another day. You know Thomas and Bartholomew found themselves a couple days a week going back to that spot, looking back up in the air. Is he coming back today? Is it today? 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 A year probably went by and they're still outside. Today? 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 And at some point, maybe they began to lose hope. I don't think they did. But they patiently and they continue to keep a kingdom perspective of saying, God is coming back. He's coming back. The one that I love, my best friend, he's coming back. We must keep that in perspective. I used to have this thought. I used to think to myself, Lord, why don't you come now? Because people are falling away from you. People are, are, are turning away. The world is starting to turn their backs on you. And they're starting to turn away from the teachings. Those thoughts were before I had a global perspective of people following God. While it may be true that people in America were turning away and falling away from God, that wasn't true for the rest of the world. The rest of the world are having people who are running to God, who are, who are seeking God, people who are walking miles. I mean, 13 miles to go be in service with God. And there's no, there's no seating in those places, but they're standing up for three hours to engage with God. Think about that for a moment. What are you willing to do to get to the feet of God? These people said, you know what? And they're growing. They're growing in their faith. And we must keep this kingdom perspective that the Lord will return. His timing is always right. And it's always right on time. Remember, as we look for him and his return, the words that we see in 2 Peter. Let me read 2 Peter to you real fast. 2 Peter 3. But do not overlook this fact, beloved, that which the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count it slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, that all should reach repentance. Friends, let me say this. God is a really, really, really big God with a universal, historical, and future-based plan. He is not only a God of America with an immediate desire. That's not the plan that he's working on. He's got this whole, I mean, he's going back generations, and he's going four generations, and he's bringing people into him. And he is patiently waiting that some should begin to in, engage in a relationship with him. Think about that for a moment. The very son and daughter, the very aunt, uncle, niece, nephew that you've been praying for, God is patiently waiting that more people would come into a relationship with him. Wow, that's good news. He patiently waited for you, yeah? I know he waited for me. My mama was praying, my daddy was praying that I would get it right, that I would quit being a knucklehead, and that I would come into the saving grace and understanding of God. I'm so glad God waited for me because I'm not going to, I don't have the story. My story does not include me always living right. I was not always righteous. I did not always do the right thing. But God seen fit that he would patiently wait. How about you? Did he wait for you? Or am I the only one? And he's patiently waiting that more people would come into a relationship with him. Thank God for his patience. Because it's not just about, hey, let me just get five people saved so that I can hurry up and end this thing so that I could just say, hey, I got five people with me. No, God wants everyone with him. He does not want any to perish. And so if he wants to wait just a little bit longer, is that okay with you? Ah, So we patiently wait. We keep a kingdom perspective when we wait. And then this next part tells us this. In the waiting, do not grumble or judge one another. Now, this might be hard, but let's look at it. Here's what it says. We're now in verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. God is very clear here. He's telling us not to judge, and he's telling us not to, to grumble against one another. Don't judge how someone else handles patience or suffering. Sure, it might be true. Some people may not wait in the same way that you do, and some people may not be very good at it. Okay, true. It's all right, though. We must be careful 
that you're not judging someone else's perceived shortcomings in their waiting. Please also make sure that we're not judging someone else and thinking that we know who is heaven bound and who is not. None of us have that right. None of us know who's making it and who's not. Be reminded that the Lord judges the heart, not outward appearances. Just as Jesus uh, said, judge not that you may not be judged. The one that you are ready to judge is a son or daughter of God who actually went to the cross and died for that person. Be careful how you're judging. Be careful how you're frustrated. And be careful how you think or perceive that someone else is at fault. I mean, I want to ask a question. What do you get out of judging somebody else? What do you get out of that? Does it increase your chances of making the heaven if you could find somebody else's fault or should I say perceived fault? Careful with judging. Well, what do you get? It's not going to help you. Judging does not fit well. It clashes. Judging Christians, if you're judging as a Christian, it clashes with being a Christian. It clashes as much as wearing a yellow and green flower blouse with pleated orange and red safari skirt. It doesn't go together. All right? Cut it out. Let us get ourselves together. Pause for a minute with all the judging. Pause for a moment with all of the, the grumbling and, and, and the hemming and hawing. And just ooh, take it easy. Pray for people. Pray for their patience. Pray for them in their waiting. Pray for them in their struggles. That's what we do. And we hold one another up. Let's leave the judging thing to the expert judge. Remember 1 Corinthians 4, 5. It tells us, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, because the Lord, who will bring the light of all things hidden mm, in darkness and will discipline the purposes, like he will disclose, like he will do all these things at the appointed time. So let us grow in understanding. Yeah, you might see some people doing wrong, and they might think that they're covering up, don't you recognize that God will bring it to light? So we take heart in that. Now this next part, I'm not going to lie, this is a hard one, guys. We thought patient was difficult. This next one, hmm, let me know when you're ready for it. You ready? Suffering. Ooh, bad word. Suffering in your waiting. Listen, listen, I know. You, you may experience some suffering in this thing, okay? In your waiting process, let me read it. Let me read it. We're, we're on verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. All right, we got to talk about it. We got to talk about it. Suffering is real. And you may experience suffering in your waiting. How will you respond to it? It may be physical. It may be emotional. Some suffering comes by way of loss. Some of it is by a deep, deep spiritual lament. Honestly, there can be many different types of suffering that, that you or I would go through. You might experience this in a way. Now, I wonder, can I encourage you to stay strong in the midst of your suffering while waiting for God to bring the breakthrough or to accomplish his purpose in your life? Don't walk away from the Lord. Matthew 5.10 tells us, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven some people do walk away from god in the midst of suffering you know what some of us don't get life on easy street some of us grow up across the street from easy street we're on not easy street difficulties and opposition come knocking on the door and some people are thinking that if God is letting bad things happen to them, then he must not either care or he must not be a good God or he's really not worth following. Let me encourage you that suffering may happen. And it doesn't mean anything more than suffering may happen. Respectfully, respectfully and carefully. Let me say this to you. The Lord isn't interested in all of us, all the people on earth, just having life on easy street. He's not. He's not interested in everybody having easy street while there is a war going on. 
there is a war going on. And, and we must be mindful that, that there is a war going on all around us. Light versus darkness, good versus evil, imps versus angels, surrounded by such a crowd of witness. Remember this? Easy Street, our glorified bodies, great, beautiful worship. Yeah, we're going to have that in heaven for sure. But, and there might be some remnants of that which we can have on earth. But I want to encourage you and remember that suffering is real and there is a war going on. If there wasn't a war, then why would Jesus go to the cross? Was that not war? And he went to the cross so that he could become the great mighty warrior who stands before us and leads us where? Into battle. And we're in battle. If we weren't in battle, then why would God tell us to take on the full armor of God? That we could withstand the wiles and the darts and the arrows that are coming flying at us. There's a war. There's a spiritual thing that's happening all around us. And yes, sometimes we experience these casualties. Sometimes we experience these difficulties as we're waiting for God's return. But may I encourage us to keep going, to fight the good fight. Why would we fight a good fight if there's not a war? There is a fight. And God has enlisted us. He's drafted us. Draft day is going on right now uh, in NFL. And listen, people are getting great people on their team. But God wants you on his team. He's drafted you. And he said, you know what? I see something in you that could benefit my kingdom. I want you on my team. And again, like I said a couple weeks ago, there is no price that he wasn't willing to pay to draft you. He's enlisted you. He's wrote your name on the roll. And he said, you know what? Gear up. Take a stance. I'm enlisting you into this army. I'm enlisting you into one of my soldiers because I trust you with my kingdom going forward. I didn't just trust the loving guys with the, with the gospel back in the day and think that that was it. Yes, the disciples were great enlistments, but he said, I want more people on my team. And guess who he chose? You and the person sitting next to you on the couch, even if they're in their pajamas. Yes, them too. And so we get excited that, yes, sometimes in our waiting, we might experience suffering, but suffering doesn't have to be viewed as a bad thing. Sometimes it's just casualties of war. Sometimes it's just collateral damage. Sometimes, 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 sometimes we need to remember that in the suffering, we can still place on the fruit of the Spirit, joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, loving, all these things we can place on side of us right now, even if we're suffering, even if Corona has you down and out, even if your finances are busted, even no matter what you're facing, even if you're sick and you got a runny nose, even if, 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 suffering, bring it on, right? Not that we want to say, Lord, I hope I get more suffering today. I'm not saying be crazy in your prayer life. But if it comes, Lord, may we be found fit and ready to handle it. During Easter week, we talked about this one. We talked about Peter. Everybody talks about Peter during Easter week, right? What happens? We know Peter did what? He, he walked away from the Lord, right? He denied Jesus three times. Remember that? Peter denied Jesus three times, and we focused on that during Easter week. But what we don't do is, is, is remember a little bit about what was said just a few hours before, Jesus, or before Peter denied Jesus. I want you to take a look. Head over to Luke for a moment if you have a Bible. If not, I'll read it to you. But we get to Luke 22. Let me read this to you guys because there's some, something there that you may not have have known before or maybe you just kind of overlook it when you read it so we're going to read Luke 22 I'm going to start at verse 31 if you don't have it just just listen up uh, if you do have it if you're still trying to find it well God bless you uh, it says Simon Simon behold Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and when you have turned again strengthen your brothers Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. You know what? It sounds all nice and good when everything is on easy street, right? When, when there's no suffering going around, when there's no persecution in front of you, it's easy to say, Lord, I'll follow you to death. I'll go to the prisons. I'll do whatever. But 
But when the nightfall comes and you see Jesus getting beaten, you're wondering to yourself, whoo, it might be better for me to tap out right now. It might be better for me to check out. Right now, let me just say this. Keep going. Keep going. Face it. Look at the scripture, though. I wonder if you've missed this before. Before Peter wouldn't have made that statement, before we get to that part, do you notice what it says above that? Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. Does that remind you of somebody else's story? Job? Was there a conversation that was going on? Peter was living his life in such a way that Satan demanded to have him. Ooh, we like to blame Peter, but we didn't recognize that Peter was being plotted on. Maybe next time we need to give a little bit of a break to, to our brother Peter. You know, maybe we need to stop doing that judging thing of, of Peter because he, you know, what would you have done? I don't know. But anyways, listen. So the next part of this is this. So Satan demanded to have him that he might sift him like wheat. But what did Jesus do? The scripture says, but I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Hmm. Jesus prayed for him that his faith may not fail. And then when you have, look at this, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Notice this, catch this, catch, catch this, guys. Don't, don't walk away yet. Don't, don't walk away yet. Catch this. Jesus knew that, that Peter was being, trying to be sifted out by Satan. And Jesus interceded on Peter's behalf that he would not have a failing faith. That even though he might turn in his suffering, even though he might turn for a moment, that his faith would not be abandoned and that he would return back to him. And then Jesus prayed that Peter would turn, that he would return, and that in his return that he would strengthen the brethren. Oh, Peter, do you remember when he got reinstated by Jesus at the beach? And then he said that he put all that back on to Peter and said, go feed my lambs, go teach, go love. He, he reinstated them, and Peter became this vessel that he would continue to teach and lead the people in the charge of God. May I say to you, it doesn't matter where you've come from and if you've drifted away from the Lord, do you know that you have all ability to come and be reinstated back to him? Be reinstated. Oh, that's beautiful. And that you have a God that doesn't just idly watch you go through life, but he prays for you. Have you thought about this? Maybe the next time you're ready to pray, why don't we consider this? Go to Jesus and say, Jesus, can you pray for me? If you prayed for Peter, can you pray for me? Because there's nothing better than God having a conversation with God about us. He is on your side. He drafted you. He prays for you. And he encourages you to keep going forward. That's good news. So we have this opportunity. Hebrews 11. Now, Hebrews 11, it's, it's, it's good stuff. Listen to what it says real fast. We like the good part, but it does have a another part to it. Watch this. So this is Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 32. It's all about suffering. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, or made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. We like that part. That's good stuff, right? Ooh, yeah, Lord, maybe I do powerful things in you because there's a war going on. Yeah. Uh-oh, boy, wait for it. Wait for it. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, 
so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonments. They were stoned and they were sawn in two. They were killed by, with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Yeah. Suffering, it's real. Life may be rough for you, friends, but can I encourage you to keep on going? You may experience some rough suffering, but do know that that doesn't mean that God is against you. It doesn't mean that God hates you. It doesn't mean that God has abandoned you, and it doesn't mean that God doesn't care for you. Sometimes suffering comes to the ones he loves. It's not always a punishment. It may just be the impact of you living right. Suffering may come, but I pray we can handle it well. And this takes us to our next point. So he goes on here to this next one. Verse 11, behold, we consider those who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. We have a lesson from Job's suffering. How many times have you pointed to him when you were trying to comfort somebody else? Mind you, the only way that you could point to someone else is if Job were willing to suffer and finish the course. You know, Job didn't recognize what was going on. He just knew that he found himself in the middle of suffering. There was a war going on, right? There was a war. Satan, God, conversations. There was a war of light and darkness, of good versus evil. Notice how Satan tried to, just like Peter, sift him out. But the Lord prayed for him. Job turned again, and he became the strength to his brothers and sisters. Oh, have you ever been encouraged by Job's story? Have you ever looked at his suffering and said, man, I don't have it as bad as that brother. I mean, have, have you ever had to scrape the, the flesh off your skin because it was just boils? And have you ever had just lost everything in an instant? We look to Job and we remember what he's gone through and he gives us strength. And sometimes someone right now is looking at you. See the potential in your story. We can be blessing we can be blessing people right now by the way that we handle our adversity. The way that you handle it may be the strength and the, and the purpose and the thing that people are looking at saying, wow, look at sister so-and-so. They, they got it. They, they're going through so much, but they're, they got this joy on the inside of them. So I want to encourage us to handle it well. Someone is watching you. What hope will you give? First Peter 2. 18 through 25. Here's what it says. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and to the gentle, but to the, also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to you, for to, for to this, you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were strained like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. May we hold on. May we remain steadfast, even in the suffering. We're waiting, yes, but in the suffering, don't give up. Don't lose hope. Hold on and be that courageous rock that will not be moved as you stand strong and powerful and bold for Jesus Christ. The Lord is coming back. 
and he's coming back for us. Let us come back to his presence, even if you found yourself as a wandering sheep. Mm -hmm. He restores. Ask Peter about it. This last part is this. It's telling the truth. Telling the truth and watching the things that come out of our mouth. It, the, verse 12, it says, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. You know, it's been my experience that people who need to say, I swear to God, typically are very good at being liars. And they need a little extra something to try to make their statement have weight to it. To try to convince you that what they're saying is true. If they didn't lie so much, then they probably wouldn't have to say, I swear to God. Or, I put that on my mama. Leave your mama alone. Let her live a good life. Stop putting things on mama. She doesn't want to be a part of your scheme. Let her live in peace. Just let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Don't make false promises either. Lord, if you get me out of this, I promise I'm going to blank, 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 blank. Listen, do blank, 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 even if he doesn't get you out of it. Be willing to do that. Be willing to live for him no matter what you're facing. That's what it's all about. Living for him, not making these false promises, not making these, these empty things. Because let me remind you something. When you say, Lord, if you do this for me, I will do, you're basically entering into a covenant with him. And if you're entering into a covenant with him, that's making a promise to him. And you don't renege. You don't, you don't go against your promises to an all-powerful, mighty God. You don't break that oath. You don't just say, oh, I'm going to do this and not do it. How do you think that turns out? Not good. I mean, you wouldn't go up to a mafia boss, man, and say, you know what, I'm going to do this and not do it. That's not smart. You don't go up to the gang member and say, hey, you know what, hey, I'm going to do this for you and not do it. Then why would we do that with someone who is more powerful, our God? We must, if we're going to make a promise, we make a promise. But be careful with just swearing by having that. When he says don't swear, he's not using, I'm really using, not using profanity. Although, listen, Christian brothers and sisters, let me just say it. Edify the speech that's coming out of your mouth, please. Please. If you're cussing as much as a person who's not saved, what is your testimony? Please cut that out. Get, build your vocabulary. I, I'm not going to beat on this too much, but please be a good example. If you're cussing every other second, come on, get it together. And then let me say this too. Even though it's not what it's, it's referring to, let me say this too. The things that come out of your mouth while you're waiting, you could be a really bad testimony. If while you're waiting, you're doing this, uh, uh, you've got barbecue sauce in your teeth, cut it out. All that, uh, stop smacking your lips. Yes, you're waiting, get over it. We have to do that sometimes. Man, yesterday, I, I'm not gonna lie. Yesterday I was inside of What's the name of that place? Little Caesars. Because they got the hot and ready, right? And we were like, hey, you know what? We're going to just avoid some time. We're going to go in Little Caesars. They got the hot and ready. Going to go in and get the pizza, head home, and enjoy life. Order the Little Caesars. Order the hot and ready. They said, we don't have any hot and ready ready. I said, well, how long does it take for the hot and ready to be ready? They said, about 10 more minutes. I said, all right, I'll wait for the hot and ready to be ready. And you know what happened when I was waiting for the hot and ready to be ready? It wasn't ready in 10 minutes. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Now, you know what I was doing? I was making use of my time. I was preparing for the sermon. I was like, I'm just standing there. So I'm, I'm reviewing my notes for the message. I was patiently waiting for pizza that did not come in hot and ready. And it did not come in her 10 minutes. It came 40 minutes later. I could have ordered my own specialty pizza. I could have ordered a deep dish from DiGiorno's. Or not DiGiorno's. What's the name of that place? Giordano's. Mm -hmm. I could order a deep dish. But I had hot and ready that wasn't ready. But God is saying, hey, don't preach about it if you're not willing to do it. Lesson learned, Lord. And this earlier when we got ready to start the service and all of a sudden it was like time to start speaking and I had to wait for it to reconnect and it was saying my mic, yep, wait for it. Lord, we will wait patiently for you and we will watch our communication in the waiting process. We ain't going to cuss nobody out because we got to wait. 
And I felt so bad for the employee yesterday because when I actually, after a while, I did go up to her and said, did you guys forget about me? And she went to the back and she pulled two pizzas and, and the boss started yelling at her and she was like, hey, he's been out there waiting for 40 minutes. I don't want him to yell at me. No, sweetie, I ain't gonna yell at you. I'm so sorry that you get yelled at. God bless you. And we gotta start blessing people while we're waiting. Let's have joy while we're waiting. Let's experience the fruit of the spirit while we're waiting. Yes, you might have to wait. And, and while we wait, we're practicing waiting for the Lord. Hey, listen, I was telling my family members the other day, I said, listen, I think I get great practice for waiting. I've been waiting for my Detroit Lions to win a game, to go to the Super Bowl for a long time. They ain't going. But year after year, I say, this might be the year. They win two games. They set me up for failure. They win two to start the season out. I'm like, look, there they go. No, they ain't going. But this might be the year. We might get a draft pick. And you know what? This might be the year that the kingdom of God really advances because God has drafted you. He's drafted you to be a part of his team. You might think that you're worthless. You might think that you don't have enough to contribute. But let me encourage you. You do have something to offer to the kingdom of God. So guess what? Let's get going. Let's get going. Let's, let's, let's. Now, when it comes to waiting, don't wait anymore on you saying yes to God. Go ahead. Get activated. Let's get going. Don't you wait and you get moving. But we wait on God for what he's doing while we're moving. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much because you have been faithful and you have been good. And Lord, we started this message off talking about waiting for ice cream. And Lord, some of us may find ourselves off on the rocky road with moose tracks all around and bear claws clawing at us. And we might not be experiencing life with Mackinac Island fudge. But God, like Superman, you rose from the grave and you have conquered death. And you allow us, Lord, to have this sweet vanilla of a relationship with you. And Lord, you didn't just come for one people from America, but like Neapolitan, you have all flavors in mind, all races in mind. And we are waiting patiently for you, Lord, to save as many as you can. So help us, Lord, in our waiting. Help us while we wait for the things to line up that we're struggling whether it be finances or our own salvation. Lord, we look to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you guys.